Our chapters today focus on the, the plight of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I've highlighted in my uh, Bible, in verse 5, in verse 7, in verse 8, in verse 10, in chapter 13, in verse 1, we've got that recurring phrase, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we're interested in these inhabitants because the Gogian Confederacy, in this chapter, has laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And what we're going to see is that the, the, the Jewish people are at last going to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ to recognize him as their Messiah, and they will mourn for him as one, one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, we're interested to see the, the, the overall structure um, of the two chapters that we've been asked to study tonight. And um, very simply, we see that the first half of chapter 12 uh, down to about verse 9, we see the, the events of Armageddon, finishing in verse 9, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's the battle of Armageddon. Uh, and then we see the rest of the chapter, the, the, the mourning of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, of those uh, who are in that city, and we see that their mourning is, is set apart, and we shall look at why that might be uh, a little later on. Moving to chapter 13, and ju just broadly speaking again, what we see in the first half of the chapter, down to about verse 5, is the, the, the removal of apostasy, the removal of false teaching within the land that will take place at the very beginning uh, of, of the kingdom age, if you like, or, or the point at which the Lord Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And, and then we see... Uh, from verse 6 to the end of chapter 13, a recognition by the Jewish people that what they have, have done in their past is smite the good shepherd. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at why that is so significant uh, to them. So, be beginning in chapter 12, we understand that the significance of Jerusalem, the witness that Jerusalem is and always has been and will be uh, to our God, to the God of Israel. And so we, we see Jerusalem, if you like, jumping out of the page, verse 2 through verse 3, verse 5, verse 6, and, and so on. You, you, you can highlight uh, at least 12 occurrences uh, in chapter 12 and 13, verse 1 of Jerusalem. This city in which God has put his eye. And, and what we see in, in verse 2 is that God says he'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, <coughs> a cup of reeling to all the people round about when they shall be in the sea. So the nations that set themselves round about Jerusalem that are in the siege, those nations... God says he'll make to them, Jerusalem, a cup of trembling. In addition to it being a cup of poison to all the nations round about, we also see that in that day, verse 3, God will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. So the, the, the nations that lay siege to Jerusalem, that place will be like a cup of poison. And yet we're also told that for all people, all that burden themselves with it will be cut in pieces, that all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And so, brothers and sisters and young people, Christadelphians are interested in Jerusalem. This city in which is wrapped up the promises, this city which we've just sung of, prayed, for the peace of Jerusalem, this particular city, God says, will be a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it. And it goes without saying, doesn't it, that we've been extraordinarily interested in the last 12 months or so to see the nations of the world show such interest in Jerusalem. 
So this was in December last year. You, you know this story very, very well. We all do. There won't be many people on earth who don't know of this story. Now think about how significant that is. That this news story was so great 12 months ago that there aren't many people on earth that won't know of what it was that Trump decided to do. When he said he would move the American embassy to Jerusalem because, he said, Jerusalem is Israel's capital. Well, no, not, no sooner has he said it than on the, uh, the, what was it, the 21st of December, 2017, United Nations General Assembly quickly got together. And the nations of the world said, this is not on. Jerusalem, Trump can't move the American embassy to Jerusalem. It can't happen. And so they voted on whether Jerusalem should be recognized as Israel's capital. You just see here in the bottom right hand corner. And what you see is overwhelming. The nations of the world said, no, Jerusalem should not be recognized as Israel's capital. The, the green nations are in the sort of world back there that you might just about be able to see were those who voted in favor of this resolution that, that Jerusalem should not be the capital of Israel. And isn't that extraordinary? On the 21st of December, just this year. But we know, don't we, that in May of this year, apologies, May 2018, Trump, despite global opposition, moved the American embassy to Jerusalem. I'm going to try and play this video uh, and see what happens with the sound. <laughs> As I said in December, our greatest hope is for peace. The United States remains fully committed to facilitating a lasting peace agreement. While presidents before him have backed down from their pledge to move the American embassy once in office, this president delivered. Because when President Trump makes a promise, he keeps it. The truth is that Jerusalem has been and will always be the capital of the Jewish people, the capital of the Jewish state. May the opening of this embassy in this city spread the truth far and wide, and may the truth advance a lasting peace between Israel and all our neighbors. God bless the United States of America, and God bless Jerusalem. And what happened? Well, key players across the world stood up. Putin, deeply concerned by Trump's Jerusalem move. Now, we're interested, as Chris Adelphine's Bible students, in what it is that the head of the Russian state has to say on things. Because we understand that that is the dragon power. Think of Nebuchadnezzar's image that he dreamt. Think of the power of Rome. Children, you, you know what happened to the Roman power. It's split into two. The eastern and the western side. The eastern side, the eastern side, that leg, is, uh, was Constantinople and of course moved, uh, the, the third Rome was Moscow. Putin was deeply concerned, this news article said, by Trump's Jerusalem move. And notice what he says. He says, Moscow believes that the status of Jerusalem should be settled through talks between the Palestinians and Israel in line with the United Nations resolutions. Those of you who have been watching the news this week, you know that Russia doesn't care a jot what the United Nations has to say on any international subject. And yet, they're calling Israel to account under United Nations resolutions. Who else has got something to say? The, e the UN, the European Union, and the Pope. The European Union's Union countries blast the US embassy move to Jerusalem. So the dragon power, Russia, is on the east. On the west, the beast power. Who's the beast? Europe, 
right? We're interested in Europe. So we're interested in what comes out of Russia. We're interested in what comes out of Europe. But what Europe have got to say. Who else are we interested in? Revelation 16, the dragon, the beast, and the... Urges world leaders to respect the UN position on Jerusalem. Why this is so interesting. The UN position is born out of the frog-like spirits. It's an address for another time. Perhaps we'll have a crack in January. But that's what we're seeing coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And then, in July, what did Israel do? Come on, we know. What did they do? They passed the... In the, in the Israeli parliament, what, what law went through? The nation-state law is what everyone's thinking, isn't it? Right? So the Jewish nation-state law was passed in the next 19th of July, 2018. This is a hugely significant event. Now, just have a look carefully. After a decade of political wrangling and explosive acrimonious debate, this most contentious of laws was never going to pass quietly. The board signalled that the Jewish state law had passed by seven votes. Q up. Furious Arab members of parliament tore up copies of the bill as they shouted apartheid at right-wing Israeli legislators. As one protesting MP was removed by security, Ayman Ode, leader of the mostly Arab joint list party, symbolically held up a black flag over the bill. A black flag, he said, hovers over this evil law. The bill describing Israel for the first time as the national home of the Jewish people has far-reaching implications, prompting accusations that the most hardline right-wing government in Israel's history is formally codifying racism. So today we have made a law in stone. This is our country, this is our language, this is our anthem and this is our flag. Long live the State of Israel. So, young people, whose reaction are we interested in to this? Who particularly across the world, all nations, will come to this particular place? Who are we really interested in straight away? Russia? Why? Who is Russia? They are the... Don't let me do this much on me. Dragon, yes, right? We're also interested in who? You, Europe, why? They are the... Look how many horns. No? Yeah, right? The beast. And we're also interested in... I'm Steve, you want to stand up? Uh, we're also, of course, aren't we interested in the false prophet, right? And so when you see things happening around Jerusalem, Look at their reaction. Look what they've got to say. The EU leads criticism after Israel passes the Jewish nation state law. We expect that to happen. What do they say? EU warns nation state bill could harm Israeli democracy. What does he say here? The respect for, can anyone read that? Human rights. Are we surprised? The frog like spirits. That's their issue uh, about what it is that Israel are doing. Russia, the Jewish state law greatly complicates the Middle East peace. This is now the Vatican News. Now this is what the, the, the Vatican News has got to say on this issue. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of hide the bit when I show you. Disregarding, what does it say? Human rights and equality. So this is coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Of course, we know that all nations will be gathered. The UN voice is concerned over Israel's Jewish nation state law. What do they say? Their concern, we reaffirm the United Nations' respect for the sovereignty of states to define their constitutional character while emphasizing the need for all states to adhere to universal human rights principles. Revelation 16 tells us that the vehicle that will bring the nations to Armageddon is the frog-like spirits. And that has to come out of their mouth.
And it's coming out of their mouth. Because of what's happening today in Israel and in Jerusalem. In September, what are we, two months ago, the Palestinian leader stands up and gives in his annual speech to the United Nations, he talks about the issue of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, he said, is not for sale. He says the path to peace is enshrined in the UN resolutions. It's enshrined, he says, in the problem experience. All right? That's what he's saying. Mr. Abbas also highlighted what he called the racist laws enacted recently in Israel. Of course, he's referring, isn't he, to the nation-state laws that were passed just a couple of months before that. And so, brethren, sisters, and young people, when we read Zechariah chapter 12, we understand that we're reading of the time when the Gogian Confederacy will come down. Now, give me a chapter where we read about the Gogian Confederacy. The two major ones, aren't there? Come on, let's have them. Ezekiel 38, super job. And its parallel chapter is... Come on. Well, Ezekiel 39 carries on, Noah, so that's a great one. The parallel chapter is Daniel 11. Come on. Come, I want you to come to Daniel 11. Ezekiel 38, you know, talks of the Gogian Confederacy coming down. They come down onto the mountains of Israel, onto the West Bank territory, before they come crashing through the land. Now, Daniel 11 shows us what happens. Um, we're interested, particularly this week, in this detail, that the king of the north will come against him, that the king of the south pushes at the king of the north, and the king of the north will come down, verse 40, against him like a whirlwind. So with great speed, with chariots, so a great army, and with horsemen, and with many ships, and he'll enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass through. He'll go into the glorious land. He'll go into Israel. He comes all the way down to Israel, down into Egypt. And then he hears tidings, verse 44, out of the east and out of the north. So you've got a picture that he's in Egypt. And he hears tidings in the northeast. And those tidings give him such trouble that he goes with great fury, the end of verse 44, to utterly... Uh, to destroy and utterly to take away many. And he plants the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end. So the glorious holy mountain is Mount Zion between the seas, the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea, Mount Zion there. Where is he? Tell me the city. He's encamped against Jerusalem, isn't he? When he's heard the tidings, now what he heard, he's heard that there's something happening to the north and to the east. Perhaps the ground's trembling. Perhaps the march is on. Perhaps it's the saints marching from the judgment up to Jerusalem. But he goes with great pace and he beats them there and he gets and sets up camp in Jerusalem. But we read in verse 40, that he's going to come with a great army and with many ships. Why are we interested in that this week? What we've seen in the news, right? We've all seen it. Well, this Russian is going back to air this and way. sea activity around UK waters has increased dramatically in recent years. It is back up at Cold War levels and it is getting worse. This is a resurgence uh, that has come very quickly. It, it is an intensifying resurgence of capability and scale um, that we didn't necessarily see coming uh, maybe 10 years ago. So this is uh, Sir Philip Jones, the first Sea Lord, talking from Britain's perspective the great threat that Russia is posing to the world in its naval capacity. Top US Admiral warns of Russian submarine threat. This is this week now. This is on Saturday. British Army Chief, Russia, he says, far bigger threat than IS. What else happened on Saturday? Ukraine claims Russia rammed our tugboat off Crimea. Tension escalates after Russia seizes Ukraine naval ships. This is Sunday. 
This is today. The UN Security Council meets and they discuss what happened. I just feel like the angels are on overdrive working for us. Because we're told, aren't we, that the King of the North is going to come with many ships and to wake us up, to shake us, to say, look, it's on. We're being shown the movements of the Russian ships as surely they prepare. The whole world knows something's up. It's being discussed today at the highest level in the world. The ships of Russia. Now, we know from Daniel, don't we, that the King of the North comes up. And I'd like us to try to spend five, ten minutes or so tracing his steps. So he comes from Egypt and he plants his palace between the seas, between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Now come to Isaiah chapter 10. This section of Isaiah is an extraordinary section, really all the way through to Isaiah 35, where we read, Isaiah 35 of course the kingdom chapter, so Isaiah 10 all the way through Isaiah 34, we see the latter day Assyrian. We see it fulfilled in the first instance during the times of the, the kings of Israel, particularly around Hezekiah uh, and others too. But it speaks of a greater fulfillment than in the times of Isaiah. It talks of the latter day Assyria. And so I think that in Isaiah chapter 10, we're given this picture of the Gobian Confederacy now as they come to the hill of Jerusalem, to that place spoken of in Zechariah chapter 12, the holy mountain. So verse 28 we read, he's come to wife, he's passed to Midron at Michmash, he's laid up his carriages. They've gone over the passage, they've taken up their lodging at Geba, Ram is afraid, Gibeah of Saul is fled. So try, try to picture, you know, you know these places that are just in the territory of Judah. Lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galilee. Cause it to be heard under Lesh, O poor Anathoth. Who came from Anathoth? Jeremiah? Anathoth is just two miles northeast now of Jerusalem. But Nina is removed. The inhabitants of Gibi gather themselves to flee. As yet shall he remain at Nob that day. What happened at Nob? Remember? Remember David going there? Don't you? To, to, to take shelter? Now here they are. And this, I'm sure now, is the Gogian Confederacy. And he'll shake his hand at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem, because they believe that the battle plans are laid. That all the nations have been gathered. And I'm sure that the generals now come together and the discussions are had will make the city fall in the morning. And so Isaiah chapter 30, just quickly turn here, we're picking up these snippets that we're given from the latter day Assyrian. We read in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 17. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall he flee, till he be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on the hill. Well, you stay here, but do you remember what, uh, uh, what Elijah's message has been to the inhabitants of Jerusalem? Isaiah chapter 40, I'll, I'll read it to you. Isaiah says to them, O Zion that brings good tidings, get up into the high mountain. And so he's encouraging those in the city, get up into the high mountain, get high up into Zion. In Isaiah chapter 30, where we are, Till he be left as a beacon on the top of a mountain, as the end sign on the hill. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious to you. Therefore will he be exalted that ye may have mercy upon you. The Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. And so they're being encouraged by Elijah. And any disciple saint that have been sent with Elijah, turn to the Messiah. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He's marching up through Eden. He's going to come and save you. You've got to get on your knees and recognize him as your Messiah. And so it's in that context that we come to Zechariah chapter 12. You might want to keep a mark in Isaiah 30. It's helpful later on.
Just come back to Zechariah chapter 12, where you certainly need a marker, where we read that the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints is to get straight to the save the tents of Judah first. So for all the conflict that's taken place in the land, all the fact that the land has been decimated by the northern invaders, it's ploughed through, gone down into Egypt. Many have hidden themselves in Moab, where the Moabites have provided a, a refuge for them. But the Lord doesn't go to them first. He's going first to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the tents of Judah, to save them. Because the armies of Gog are set to take the rest of that city. We know, don't we, Zechariah chapter 14, that half of the city, just turn the page, I know this is a chapter for a couple of weeks from now, but it, it's all the same event, so we need to, to use a few of these verses. Where we read uh, in verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, when thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, half of the city shall go forth into uh, captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So half of it's taken. And the call is going, get higher, get higher, get up into Mount Zion. And call for the Lord Jesus Christ. Recognize him as the Messiah. And at that stage, the great earthquake takes place. Now, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints have come, they march, the march of the rainbow angel, they come from Sinai all the way up around the east side of the Dead Sea and they've come in and they've come by the way of the east. Revelation 16 and verse 12 tells us that the, the Euphrates must be dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. We understand that the king of the east is us as we come in on the eastern side of Jerusalem. Young people, why is that interesting? Which mountain is on the eastern side of Jerusalem? It's not Zion. It's the olives. Which mountain did the Lord Jesus ascend up into heaven from? The mountain of olives. And what did he say to his disciples? We all, we all know it, don't we? We learned it as a proof that he would come back to that place in the same way that he'd left. And so now, the Lord and the saints, they come to the eastern side of the city. And brethren and sisters, I wonder, look at verse 5, that once the earthquake goes, we read that they flee by the valley of the mountains, the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azar, yea, he shall flee like as he fled before the earthquake in the days of Azar, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. Now that's a bizarre phrase, isn't it? The light shall not be clear nor dark. Well, obviously it could speak to us of even time or something like that. The Revised Version Margin gives a really interesting uh, reading. It says, another reading is, there shall not be light... The bright ones shall contract themselves. So try to picture that. But here we are with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're on the eastern side of Jerusalem. We've come up the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And there we wait. And the bright ones, that's us, the saints, shall contract themselves. Our light will be hidden. Now tell me a time in the history of the nation of Israel when men stood on the mountains around the valley and they hid their lights. What happened? Gideon, right? Who won the battle? Of course, confused God won the battle with him. And confusion reigned in the valley below. And they fought against each other. And so the Midianites were defeated. And so we wonder that that's the picture we're given here. The, the revised version margin, let me give it to you one more time. There shall not be light. The bright ones shall contract themselves. And so 
the earthquake goes as the Lord Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives, verse 4. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. You should have in your margin next to verse 4, Revelation 16, verse 18. The great earthquake which takes place when the Lord Jesus Christ shatters the Mount of Olives. And when that earthquake takes place, we're told that, that, that there's a, 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 a valley, isn't there? The Rift Valley that runs all the way down through Africa. That that earthquake that will split the Mount of Olives, uh, geologists believe, will have such massive ramifications. I read that they believe that not a two-storey building in the world would be left standing when that earthquake takes place. This is, Revelation 16 describes, a great earthquake that now takes place. And what will we do? Because if the battle is being fought by the Gogian hosts turning against each other, what will our job be? Well, we, we, we think, brethren and sisters, just come back uh, to, to Isaiah chapter 30. We wonder that we will be called to get into that city. Verse 19 of Isaiah 30. The people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious to thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And know the Lord give you the bread of mercy and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner. That, look in your margin, uh, the revised version margin, Next to yet shall not your teachers be removed into a corner. It says they shall not hide themselves. So those of us who have been hidden on the hill will no longer hide ourselves. And what will we do? Verse 21. The Jews will hear, that thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Turn to the right hand. Turn to the left. And so I, I think, Isaiah 30, verse 21. That what we will do as the saints is we'll be sent into the, the, the rubble. Think of the dust from this earthquake. Think of the panic. Think of the terror and the fright. As mums try to hold their children. As fathers try to get a grip on what's taking place. And the call comes. And it's me and you. We've been sent into that city. And we say... Hold my hand. I'll take you out. This is the way. Walk in it. Go right. Go right a bit. Go left. Go left a bit. As we get the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of this war zone. And we know, don't we, brothers and sisters, that the Gogian hosts are to be destroyed. Just come to Ezekiel chapter 38. Uh, Brother Gerald helpfully told us earlier, it's the Job chapter. So come to Ezekiel 38, where we read, following the destruction of this army that's come against Jerusalem, we read of its destruction, verse 18. It shall come to pass at the same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day. There should be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Why is there a shaking? Well, it's just been an earthquake. So the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, said the Lord God. Now look what he says. Every man's sword shall be against his brothers. What's that? It's the Midianites again, isn't it? As they turn against each other. And so the nations of the world are to know that Yahweh is the God of all the earth. I will be made known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know that I am Yahweh. Now, uh, time is moving, I think, too quickly. 
Zechariah 14, verse 3, we know that reference well, don't we? Joel 3, verse 16, make a note of Joel 3, verse 16, next to the shaking in Ezekiel 38, because in Joel 3 and verse 16, we're told the shaking, once again, that will come into that land. Isaiah 31, we read in verse 5, as birds flying, so will Yahweh of armies defend Jerusalem. Now don't forget, a couple of weeks ago, we picked up that phrase, defend Jerusalem. That Hebrew word, defend, is only ever used of Jerusalem. It's used in Zechariah chapter 12, in our chapter today. In Zechariah chapter 12, uh, we read in verse 8, In that day shall the Lord defend, that's that word, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Isaiah 31 verse 5, As birds flying, so will Yahweh of armies defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. Isn't that an amazing picture? As birds flying. This could be me and you again, right? This could be us. The angelic host that's able to now protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem to defend that city. And so, come back to Zechariah chapter 12. Having picked up what it is that we believe is taking place in these days, that now the inhabitants of Jerusalem recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. They're the first in the world to understand that that man is the Messiah. And they look at him and they recognize him for who he is. And they mourn for him, we're told in verse 10, as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. And that mourning is then described for us, isn't it? We're told it says the mourning of hadad Rimmon, the valley of Megiddo. Well, you should have in your margin there, 2 Chronicles 35, verse 24. We're not, we don't have time to go there, but you go back in your own time, you see in the reign of Josiah, when there was a great national mourning that took place here. But what's different now about this mourning, verse 12, is that the land shall mourn every family apart. And we then trip over this word, don't we? Apart, apart, apart. The house of David apart, the house of Nathan apart, the house of Levi apart, the family of Shimei apart, all the families of the reign apart, all their wives, everyone is in national mourning, but it's different from in the days of Josiah. And the suggestion that's been made that I think, uh, that I've heard no better suggestion, that to me seems reasonable, is first of all, we see the different elements of society. So the house of King David, the family of the house of the prophet Nathan, the family of the house of the priests of Levi, the family of Shimei. Now, in your margin, I'm going to suggest that you write 1 Kings 1 verse 8 next to Shimei, because that Shimei was one of David's mighty men. 1 Kings 1 8 next to Shimei. That was one of David's mighty men. So possibly we are given another group, the armed forces, the mighty men. So what have we got? We've got the, 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 the royal family. We've got the, the prophets. We've got the priests. We've got the, the armed forces. And then, if that's not enough, verse 14, all the families that remain <coughs> apart. So when then you ask the question, well, why are they apart? And I think, brothers and sisters, it's because this isn't some great emotional experience where hundreds, thousands of people have got together and one starts to weep and well, they all start to weep. It just turns into a mass hysteria with everyone weeping. This isn't that. This is genuine mourning. 
This is people, if you like, in their own homes. This is people apart, with their wives apart. This is every man and every wife and everyone in all the families, every child, weeping when they recognise what they've done. That this extraordinary nation, that the Lord God, the heavens and the earth, chose to be a nation, a special treasure, to be a witness to him for all time. A nation that God chose to bring his only son into the Lord Jesus Christ, to redeem every family, every family of the world, that this group of people, the Jews, now look at him and they break. They weep bitterly. And when we think seriously, brothers and sisters, about how we might weep, for our first one. When we might weep for one of our children, suddenly we recognise the grief in these homes when they break at the understanding of what that nation did. And so I'm sure that that is why they go apart in their grieving. And now in chapter 30, we read that in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Now I think this is rather lovely. <laughs> this next bit isn't, because what we that now read is the cutting off. In verse 2 and verse 3, we read of the cutting off of idols, of the cutting off of false prophets, of the cutting off of the unclean spirits. Why is that interesting? What are the unclean spirits like? Frogs, right? The unclean spirits now. All of that teaching that the Gogian Confederacy has brought is now being cut off and being gotten rid of in the land. And and the lovely part is that before it's cut off, verse 1, in that day shall be a fountain opened. Isn't that beautiful? that the solution is given of a fountain that is going to bring forth the word, right? After the earthquake, we understand, don't we, that the topography of the land is changed. We know from Ezekiel's temple that water will flow down from Jerusalem. A fountain has been opened, and that fountain will bring the word of life to all nations. And the word of life is able to go forth And when it goes forth, it's going to now remove false worship and false teaching from the land. And then we read in verse 6 that one, we're told that in the original there's no one there, that they shall say to him, what are these wounds in your arms? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. That that, that word, friends, is more often times related in the house of my lovers. Now, my own feeling here is that this house is the Jewish people. There he was in his own home, in, in his own nation. Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. You, 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 you could argue that um, it's from the time when he was in the upper room with the disciples. His, his truest friends. But I wonder that in the first instance it's simply talking of the house of, of the Jewish people for whom the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was wounded, those with which I was wounded. And so we then read in verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Well, this we mustn't forget, is written in the days of Zechariah, hundreds of years before the shepherd has appeared. 
And the warning says, if you smite the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. Interestingly, uh, John will, I'm sure, pick this out for us next week when he looks at chapter 11. But chapter 11 finishes with the fact that God is going to raise up to the unfaithful Israel a foolish shepherd who will reign in the land, and, and it's the foolish shepherds that look after the flock. The good shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm sure that the, that the whole chapters are, are structured around the fact that you've got these shepherds bookending them, that the good shepherd here is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the warning goes, you must not smite this shepherd. Now, that warning has been a principle for all time. It was laid out in the book of Genesis. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. What did Cain do? Cain smote the shepherd, didn't he? He smote Abel, his brother. And what was the punishment given to him? Cain said, you've driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And from thy face shall I be hid. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. That's what the curse of Cain was. He was scattered, if you like, because he smoked the shepherd. That principle laid down in the very beginning. But they didn't learn, did they? Because the shepherd was smitten. Just, we ought to just look at these references, brothers and sisters. Our time is nearly finished. We've got one more slide after this. Just come to Mark chapter 14. And we ask ourselves, why is it that this is being put here at the end of Zechariah 13? And I think it's because that the Jewish people need to be reminded of what they did to the Good Shepherd. As they look upon him whom they pierced and mourn, as they, that, that they remember what they did to the one who was the Good Shepherd. And of course, for all time, well, well, for the millennial period, everyone is going to know, have to know, about the work of the Good Shepherd. They need to know that that shepherd laid down his life, because mortality will still be in the kingdom. And so here in this picture between Zechariah 13 and Zechariah 14 of the kingdom age, we're told of the work of the Good Shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. So Mark 14, I hope you, hope you were there. We see in verse 27, the Lord Jesus quote this verse. And ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it's written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. scattered. So verse 50, it's only Mark that records this. That the sheep are scattered. They forsook him. They all forsook him and fled. That, of course, is the prophecy being fulfilled. Um, just, just come to John chapter 10. To be reminded of the work that the Lord Jesus Christ said he would do. He was not like the shepherds of Israel that Zechariah prophesied of in chapter 11. Those foolish shepherds that Ezekiel prophesied of that would not look after the nation. The Lord Jesus Christ was the good shepherd. The altogether wonderful one who was prepared to lay down his life. Verse 11, for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And we understand, don't we, that the others who are not of this fold are, of course, the Gentiles. And the work of the good shepherd that these Jews now, as they look in the wounds of the Lord Jesus Christ, as they reflect on him and on his work, they understand now that the promises are for the Jews and for the Gentiles. And so despite the great national mourning that begins to unfold in Jerusalem, moving through the inhabitants of Judah, as the outcasts of Israel are brought back, we'll look at that I'm sure next week, in chapter 11, as the, the, the morning takes place, so there's a sea change. 
And the Lord Jesus asks that they weep no more. Isaiah 30, don't need to turn there, verse 19. The people shall dwell in Zion and Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious to thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer. What does the good shepherd do? He hears, doesn't he? And he goes to the flock. When he shall hear it, he will answer it. Now, brothers and sisters, just come finally to Psalm 30. As you turn there, let me tell you that another key phrase in Zechariah 12 and 13, which you know already, is the house of David. The house of David. This national mourning is taking place now in the house of David. And Psalm 30, look, we read as a psalm of the house of David. A psalm at the dedication of the house of of David. So we're interested in this psalm. And isn't it rather lovely that what we read now in this psalm, verse 11, Thou hast turned unto me my mourning. They look upon him, they pierced and they mourn. And now they, the mourning is going to be turned into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. The end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to thee forever. And so we read just finally in verse 4. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his. Brothers and sisters and young people, this is us. This is us. We hope to be there, don't we, in that day, to be counted with the saints. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endured but a moment. In his favour is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And so, brethren and sisters, it's our prayer, isn't it? that the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, that that morning will be a morning without clouds when the Lord Jesus will come and we surely will be there in that day if in the meantime we hold fast to the truth set out in his word.